about, I'll be talking about the prizes and the Nobel Prize in Literature from last fall. So um, just dive in and uh, we'll see if this works. Maybe it doesn't. It doesn't progress, so I'll let you move on. It's not, it's not working. So if you go to the, you can move. Anyway, this is the 13th year. Okay, is it working now? There we are. 13 years of the Nobel Prize courses here. It all started when I was on the curriculum committee 13 years ago, and we were thinking of new courses to give. And it was in October. And the first week of October, I hear about the prizes being awarded, and there were six of them. And that clicked. I said, there's six weeks in our courses and six Nobel Prizes. And that's why, and I was always curious about the significance of the prizes. <clears throat> and so that's when I started this course 13 years ago. Um, and we'll talk about that briefly. And uh, Alfred Nobel, and we're going to be talking about the prizes and, and then literature and controversies, and finally about the award winner himself. Um, um, whoop. Okay. So I've already told you about that. We began in the spring of 12 for the uh, Nobel Prizes of 2011, and over 60 experts, mostly from the University of Florida, but some from the community and from elsewhere, have spoken about the significance of each of the accomplish of the accomplishments of each prize that was awarded. Uh, the terms, this term's facilitators is Ken Burns and myself. And I mention him as an active facilitator because he um, encouraged four participants of our, uh, of our courses this year, and it was a pleasure to work with him. Uh, he joined about four years ago, uh, doing what I least wanted to do and twist some arms. So we split the task and it, it's been a lot of fun. This is the program and it's in your catalog of this spring. And um, I'm adding a extra one to this on the 29th of April. And I'll tell you just briefly and then the Peace Prize was given to an activist in Iran. And I identified two Iranian students, postdoc or students, one is a postdoc, to talk about Iran. And we're going to add a session, thanks to Julianne, on the Monday, the 29th of April, where they can participate. They couldn't do it next week, and we got Ben uh, Smith, who is the uh, director of uh, the Center for Global Islamic Studies, to talk. So we'll put those together. Alfred Nobel. A great inventor, he invented dynamite, not to blow up people, but to explore and to identify, uh, to use it in a whole variety of useful ways. Those are the birth and death. And he spoke five languages fluently. He was a chemist, inventor, entrepreneur, author, pacifist, interestingly, and he, having invented dynamite, and he came up with the idea of prizes after he read his own obituary. In 1888, his brother died, but the uh, Paris newspaper identified him as the victim. And he read this, and it was a very critical obituary about his invention of dynamite and the consequences to the human uh, condition. And so he came up with this idea, and he, he lived another eight years and then died. And in his will, he established the, the foundation with 190 million equivalent dollars at the time. It's worth, foundation has about a half a billion dollars in its present worth. Um, he did uh, most of it from 
oil money from Azerbaijan, where he controlled these things. Anyway, in his last will and testament, uh, made a year before he died, he specified that his fortune be used to create a series of prizes for those who confer the greatest benefit on my, mankind in five areas, physics, chemistry, physiology or medicine, literature, and the Peace Prize. And it was all to be determined by committees of Swedish institutions. And interestingly enough, when it was established, Sweden ruled Norway. Uh, and the Norwegians didn't become independent till uh, 1905, but they had a legislature, legislature called the Storting. And he gave that authority to that a committee from that parliament. And so here we have the uh, institutions that pick, pick the winners. Physics and chemistry is the Swedish Academy of Sciences. Medicine, physiology, another institute in Stockholm, Karolinska Institute. Literature by the Swedish Academy. We'll talk more about them in a little while. And in addition, an additional Nobel Prize was proposed in 1969. And it goes by the name, the Swedish uh, uh, Royal Bank of Economic Sciences in memory of Alfred Nobel. And it's considered a Nobel. And the Swedish Academy of Sciences is responsible for awarding that as well. And the Nobel Prize itself consists of a gold medal, a personal artistic diploma uh, by an artist, uh, for the individual, a cash award worth about uh, a 10 million Swedish krona, which is about a million dollars last year. And um, the Nobel Prize have been awarded 621 times to, to I think, precisely 1,000 laureates. I don't know if they, some of them won more than once. So uh, I don't know if they counted them twice, like President Cleveland, you don't know if he's it's the 24th and the 26th president. I don't know. Anyway, and 27 organizations since 1901, which was the very beginning of the awards. And uh, 65 of the laureates have been, been women, 6.5%. And in the 21st century, a much larger percentage of laureates were women. It was a, a less, was somewhat less patriarchal um, in this century. Sometimes you wonder. And uh, sometimes no prize was awarded, uh, especially you can imagine the peace, the peace Prize wasn't awarded much during World War I and II, though the Red Cross won it in one of those years. And, uh, and it, uh, so it wasn't awarded for 19 of the last 122 years. Well, it's really 123 years now. Um, the selection process, to go over it quickly, I know some of you have heard this before, starts at the beginning, right after, actually, the, um, the awards. Uh, the award ceremonies are on the date of Alfred Nobel's death, December 10th. But over the years, it's become uh, the practice of the foundation to fund a whole series of events up to the awards on December 10th. Every Nobel laureate gives his or her address independently. There's uh, a whole variety of activities, uh, panels of discussion. Um, and um, as I'll tell you at the end, it's, they're all available at the website of the Nobel Prize uh, in Sweden. Anyway starts there, nominations are requested and submitted by the 1st of February. Uh, and uh, every one of those awarding committees accumulates a lot of nominations. It's different in, in the different prizes is who can nominate and, uh, people for the Peace Prize the governmental agencies, certain organizations can, we will see in literature in a while, who can nominate uh, possible winners. 
decisions ultimately cannot be appealed and the names of the nominations are kept secret for 50 years. So people can claim they've been nominated for a prize, but they, we don't really know. There are some mini, uh, limits. You, only three laureates, maximum of three laureates for any of the prizes and two different works for each Nobel Prize. Um, organizations and institutions can be chosen for the Peace Prize, and many have won. But, uh, and then the other limitation, and it, it has had its effect, is the, um, the laureate has to be alive at the date of the announcement. And there have been some close calls in that regard. So um, that's the situation there. It, uh, and we'll move on. Um, the ceremonies on the 10th are pretty fancy, um, especially in Stockholm, in Sweden. Uh, there is a evening banquet in the city hall, and I visited the city hall. There it is in the upper, that's my picture in the upper right. The bottom picture is, I wasn't there. Uh, really fancy. The award ceremonies, which are earlier in the day, in Stockholm for the five of the six Nobel Prizes are a fancy affair. There's the uh, King Carl XVI Gustav and the Crown Princess Victoria on the right. Uh, they have, uh, as most uh, royalty have decided that it doesn't have to be the oldest male. Uh, and that's the case in Sweden. It's the case in Denmark elsewhere. And then each one is given the prize medal uh, by the King of Sweden. He was a few years old. In contrast, the Peace Prize is in Oslo, and there's the King. Bottom left, modest, he wears a suit and a tie. I will say that much, I don't wear ties anymore. But uh, he, he doesn't have all uh, he's very Norwegian, let's put it that way. Anyway, um, and uh, now I want to talk about the prize in literature. The winner is chosen by the Swedish Academy. And the Academy was founded in 1786. 18 individuals are elected for life. And uh, that works out fine um, if if, if, if it was in the 18th or 19th or even the 20th century, but things have become more complicated in the 21st century. The winner is chosen by the Academy by, um, and um, it was to contain the best writers and scholars in Sweden and to guard and nourish the language putting out an official list of all the recognized words in Swedish. Kind of reminds you of what the French do uh, with their academy. The, they didn't like weekend, le weekend was uh, a word they didn't like, but it's become common use in France. So this is Swedish oriented. It meets weekly at a restaurant that it owns in old Stockholm for a ritual dinner. It owns real estate including luxurious apartments in Stockholm and Paris, has investments of its own estimated at $143 million. When there's that much money, there are gonna be problems. Uh, the 18 members have a whole series of perks, which they can share with their spouses as well. So we'll get back to the problems with that committee. Um, the selection process is, is similar. Uh, in this case, the members of the academy and members of the literature academies and societies worldwide, professors of literature and language, former Nobel literature laureates, and the presidents of writers' organizations are allowed to nominate candidates. Nobody can nominate themselves. The people have friends, and that helps. The point here is that... Um, that is, they established the, the, the limitation for the 
the nominees. Deadline as before is the 1st of February and they narrow the list to 20 candidates and they go about reading some of the literature that have been nominated if they haven't already. It helps if it's been translated into Swedish, but as anybody who's traveled in Northern Europe knows that the Swedes and the Danes and the Norwegians speak better English than Americans. So now it's not as much a problem if it's in, in English. Um, in October, they meet. Candidate who receives more than half the votes is automatically named the Nobel laureate in literature that year. It's a tricky thing. They announce them usually at a comfortable hour in the morning, 10 o'clock in the morning. Um, and they announce it and then they call, or maybe they call first. But anyway, they inform the Nobel laureate that he or she has won the Nobel Prize. It turns out that 10 o'clock in Sweden is very early in the morning on the East Coast and even earlier on the West Coast in America and a lot of the laureates, and this applies to all six prizes, are asleep when the announcement is made. So there are a whole series of examples of situations where people didn't, they turn their phone off at night, uh, they, and neighbors had to come over and knock on the door as if it's an emergency, et cetera. So there are amusing stories like that. So I just want to point that out. Okay, Nobel Prize in Literature, the criteria was written out by Alfred Nobel. He said that for the prize, the candidate should have bestowed the greatest benefit on mankind and writing in an ideal direction. Um, and they've been interpreted differently as, so, you know, when you, a codicil in your will, it'll be up to your children, grandchildren to interpret some things. And so each period had uh, somewhat different uh, views. So in 1900, before World War I, they were conservative idealism, holding church, state, and family sacred. And Rudyard Kipling, the youngest uh, Nobel laureate in literature, won there. Um, now he would be considered a colonialist and uh, not exactly acceptable. Uh, World War I, only Scandinavian writers won. And then in the 20s, they were more of a, as they say, I got this terminology from a, a I don't remember where, but it's from somewhere else. Wide-hearted humanity, George Bernard Shaw, Thomas Mann. And in the 30s, they decided to reach the common, the common man. And we had Pearl Buck, Sinclair Lewis, Eugene O'Neill, very uh, playwright, um, uh, accessible. In the 1940s and onward, uh, they looked at pioneers in literature, uh, the big question always with, if you wrote a great book, you uh, that put you near the top of the list, but also you look at the whole body of work. And we get that in the 40s, Herman Hesse, Andre Gide, T.S. Eliot, Ernest Hemingway, William Faulkner. In the 70s and 80s, suddenly they look beyond Europe. Uh, or at least beyond Sweden, and uh, much more so. And we had I.B. Singer as a winner there and opened it up to uh, uh, Latin America and to American authors more so. T Tony Morrison won that in that period. And in the 2000s, in the aughts, many international winners uh, won. And lately, and it still applies now, in the 20, teens and 20s, they've been more oriented back to European authors, pretty much, not exclusively. So these, it's all up to the 18 to vote. So moving on. A um, lot of, as I, you see, 116, 103 men, 17 women, of which 11 of those 17 were since 1990. Um, and the prize has been shared between two individuals on only four occasions. Usually it's a single winner. And that has a place to 
the production of literature is usually a solo, sort of like tennis. Um, it was awarded, not awarded for years, such as uh, during World War I and World War II. And they wrote in 25 different languages, thanks to more recent awards. Obviously, Swedish is among them. But we have a new language this year, and we'll talk about that in a moment. And uh, I told you Rudyard Kipling, young man, the oldest laureate was Doris Lessing, who was 88 when she was awarded it in 2007. And then she had another six years to enjoy it. So that was something. OK. Um, there are two major authors who declined the prize, having, been a, having won it. Um, Jean-Paul Sartre, uh, he said he doesn't take any official honors. So that was honorable, I guess. It saved him from giving a speech, I suppose. And Boris Pasternak, a very different situation, initially accepted the Nobel Prize, but was coerced by the Soviets to uh, decline it. And then his family were able to accept it in, his, in a ceremony in 1988. Uh, with regard to the other Nobel Prizes, uh, well, there are lots of other stories, but we'll keep to, keep to the literature. So first of all, the most obvious thing is, why didn't so-and-so win the prize? Uh, and here's a list of some of the major authors who won, some died too soon. Italo Calvino, one of my favorite authors, Italian, uh, died relatively young since they were looking at a whole bodies of of their work. Some had fame after death, like Kafka and Kabafi. And um, uh, Kafka, you know, and uh, it's so sorry when you hear about authors or painters or people who died poor, and now their works are uh, classics or selling for hundreds of millions of dollars. Others were just passed over and included uh, Borges and uh, James Joyce and sometimes uh, John Updike, as you know, I'm looking at whole story early in the century, uh, in the ninth, in the 20th century. Uh, Nobokov, some of these are your favorite authors, and uh, and and many more. And that's just the way it goes. Um, so, but there are also controversies about it, and some of them just. People rant. The one controversy is that the committee is too Eurocentric. There are more Swede winners than all the Asians and South Americans combined. Um, and some were political, uh, left over right. And, and so Jorge Borges in Argentina was a little too conservative to win it. Um, and uh, a recent winner who won in, I would say, 2019 or 18 or 19, uh, Peter Hanke was a vocal supporter of Serbia during the Yugoslav Wars. And, uh, and he won. But the, the controversy is not whether you win or lose. It's when everybody else says, how could you give such a prize to him? And then uh, singer, poet, Bob Dylan, which took, I had to find a Bob Dylan, a Dylan fan who played a guitar down in Orlando to get a speaker on him a few years ago. And popular books like Pearl Buck, who was never considered a really outstanding author, but she wrote books people love to read. Um, and then came the literature scandal of 2018. And that was when those 18 uh, had a real, uh, the husband of one of the 18 of uh, the academy decided that he could uh, make some money by cluing in um, the, the, the um, odds makers because in everything, now it's true here in America, but you can bet on anything. And in England and in France and in Europe, you can bet on the next winner of the Nobel Prize. And he, he clued in some friends in France about this and made some money for it. And there were a bunch of other 
more salacious um, uh, travesties by the same husband. And he was actually arrested for sexually abusing some women friend and he was imprisoned in Sweden for several years after this. It only happened in 2018. And that's when they changed the rules of the membership of Academy. You're allowed to resign now. You didn't have to stay life term in the previous. You couldn't quit. Now they allow people to quit. Anyway, there are many more examples in all the prizes of people overlooked, given credit for dubious achievements, and they can be reviewed under Nobel Prize controversies on Wikipedia. So make a note of that. You can find all the dirt. I want to talk about our winner this year. Good. And I have time to. Jon uh, Fossum is how it's pronounced, and is a relatively young man. He's 64, and um, he's Norwegian. And the Nobel, this is how they wrote it. The Nobel Prize in Literature is awarded to the Norwegian author Jon Fossa for his innovative plays and prose, which gave voice to the unsayable. Sayable. I have no idea what that means, but you might, when I talk about his literature, is an immense work written in Norwegian Nynorsk. I wrote it out to the right because I said, I'll never remember how to pronounce this. Nynorsk. Nynorsk is a language spoken by about 15, well, it's Norwegian, 15% of Norwegians, those around the city of Bergen in the west part of Norway. The rest, speak a very different dialect called uh, Bakmol, which means book tongue. And it's the more standardized Norwegian. And I went into looking into Norwegian and, uh, and, uh, and this, this Ni Norsk means new or Norwegian. It turns out for centuries when Denmark ruled Norway, before the Swedes ruled it, the Danes ruled it, and they required all Norwegians to speak Danish with their own local accent. Now, I don't know if I could distinguish Swedish from Danish from Norway and Norwegian, but the interesting thing is this is, this is brand new language This, uh, in the sense that nobody has won a Nobel Prize in literature using this uh, and it spanned a variety of genres with a wealth of plays, novels, poetry collections, essays, children's books, and translations. While he is today one of the most widely performed playwrights in the world, he has also become increasingly recognized for his prose. I was able to acquire his prose from our local library, and I uh, I've never seen one of his plays, but we'll see a little bit of one in a few minutes. Um, so what I want to do is go back, uh, not go forward, but go back here for a moment. And, um, and here is a Time magazine, which I don't even think has a magazine anymore, but they did an interview with him upon soon after he won it. And I want you to hear an interview with the author. The Nobel Prize in Literature for 2023 is awarded to the Norwegian author, Jon Fosse, for his innovative plays and prose, which give voice to the unsayable. I've just spoken to Jon Fosse on the phone. Um, not every laureate believes me when I make the call, but he was prepared to have confidence until one o'clock. He was driving on the countryside at Sognefjord, north of Bergen in Norway, and um, we had the opportunity to start speaking about practical matters and the Nobel Week in December. Yeah, I still uh, gentleman we can't say a little mat, but uh, I'm very really glad for the big era, for say the same. I have been in discussions about Nobel Prize in ten years, I think now. 
Så så är er lite vant med den spänningen som är er runt då, men jag är er vant med att inte få den. Så när att då skulle få den i år, det det kom oväntat på mig då. Och så det sånt. Ja, nej, det hade jag aldrig trott på alltså. Och det var jag hade ju inte en gång några särskilda ambitioner. Jag hade lust att och skriva och kunna livna med på ett eller annat vis av den skrivningen av mig då och all medgång som måste komma och tog jag emot med glädje men jag hade inte förväntat mig och inte så väldigt mycket då men bortsett för det av mig själv att det skulle inte ge mig skulle hålla på och så hade nog ett stort hopp om att det skulle ett förlag ville ge det ut det blir som för det är er helt säker på det att skriva är er en mot att leva på då Jeg begynte i 12-årsalderen, og i 64 nå, da, så jeg har skrevet I, 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 I mange, mange år, og, og mer og mer har det blitt uh, noe jeg uh, trenger, rett og slett. Altså. Hvis jeg ikke har noe å jobbe på, eller noe å skrive på, så, så vet jeg ikke helt hva jeg skal gjøre av meg. Mm. Så, så sant jeg får til å skrive godt nok til at det er verdt å gi det ut, så skriver jeg på egen ut. Kanskje, kanskje selv om jeg ikke får det ut, vet du. Ja, det vet jeg ikke. Altså, det, jeg mener at du, hvis du trenger, du må, du, hvis du har en trong til å skrive, så skal du skrive eller så kan du ikke godt la det være. Du kan ikke skrive for at du skal, tror du skal få Nobelprisen eller et eller annet sånt. Altså, da får du den helt sikkert ikke allikevel. Så du må skrive fordi du vil. Eller det presser seg, presser seg på. Liksom. Ja. Hva skal Jon Fosse gjøre resten av dine dagene? Jeg feirer med en god middag med fredelig sammen med familien. Ja. Couldn't read it from back there. He's very modest about it. What? Oh yes, yeah. thank you. If you didn't read it, uh, the the uh, because he was talking in Norwegian. I don't know if he was talking in Ni Norsk or not. But I think whatever they talk in, the the, the distinction of the languages in in writing, and I think they all understand each other. I hope. Anyway. Um, he 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 said that he writes uh partly to make a living <laughs> and uh which i think is reasonable uh he um he as a boy that's all right he as a boy um had a uh, a near death experience at around age of 7 and i'll mention this a little later about something else and then he got into writing and and uh, as he pointed out at the age of 12 and has been writing since um his style of writing is a really interesting one and i'll give you examples in a minute but i i i have taken some quotes of remarks about what i call mili- minimalism and because i think uh, that describes his style and you can be the judge in a minute. His minimalist, this is from Wikipedia, his minimalist and deeply introspective plays with language often bordering on lyrical prose and poetry have been noted to represent a modern continuation of the dramatic tradition established by Heinrich Ibsen in the 19th century. Several of Foss's notable novels have been described as belonging to the style of postmodernist and avant-garde literature due to their minimalism, lyricism, and unorthodox use of syntax. I'll give you examples of that too. So I looked up, followed that, I, that caught my eye because I'm very interested in minim- minimalism in music, but not in literature. Literary minimalism is characterized by an economy with words and a focus on surface description. Minimalist writers eschew adverbs and prefer allowing context to dictate meaning in his novella Alice at the Fire, which I'm going to read some to you, he eschews periods. Uh, he he uh, writes in a form that I've seen in more recent, uh, widely in literature, where punctuation and a variety of punctuations and uh, are done away with, which makes it confusing to the reader a bit until you get used to it. So 
And then I added minimalism in music often features repetition and gradual variation, such as Philip Glass. And I say that because I want you first to hear a little bit of Glass, and, and then I'm going to go into the literature. This is Philip Glass himself. He's 87 now, and he was playing uh, some of his a piano work. Okay, so here we have uh, what looks to be initially very repetitious, kind of boring, until you start seeing it gradually changing with time. And I'm going to be reading you a little bit of Foster's work in a minute, and, and I want that comparison. Oftentimes, music and art uh, are connected. But literature and music can be as well. And I think it is in this case. Um, and so I'm going to read from two of his books. One was written in 2003 and one in just last year. Um, I say 2010 because that's when it was translated into English. And that's the author and that's his uh, one of his major translators. And uh, I was looking at the Booker Prize in England, and um, but I couldn't find what I was after. Um, translation is so important uh, to the reader, especially since I don't read Ninorsk, and uh, I don't even read Norwegian. So translators are trip critically important in Greek literature, and it's, they're getting more respect than ever. So I am going to read you a little bit uh, from both books. And uh, I wanted to talk a little bit about the minimalism, which you won't see. In this book, he uses no periods and no quotes. He, he uses some question marks which he doesn't in this newer work, no question marks and no quotes. And um, of course we don't use quotes when we talk and nor do we, we're, we just uh, talk. So anyway, um, so let me read you some of these and then we'll see. I think I will, rather than stand, I will put this back in this, and uh, read you from some of these things. I um, wanted to read you first from uh, Alice at the Fire. Alice is the name 
of the protagonist's great grandmother. Um, these are not autobiographical, but they could be. And if you put the lights on so I can read. I'm going to be, read a little bit from the very beginning of the book. Uh, <clears throat> I, I, um, okay. I see Signe lying there on the bench in the room, and she's looking at all the usual things, the old table, the stove, the wood box, the old paneling on the walls, the big window facing out onto the fjord. She looks at it all without seeing it, and everything is as it was before. Nothing has changed, but still, everything's different, she thinks. Because since he disappeared and stayed gone, nothing is the same anymore. She is just there without being there. The days come, the days go, nights come, nights go, and she goes along with them, moving slowly without letting anything leave much of a trace or make much of a difference. And does she know what day it is today? She thinks, yes, well, it must be Thursday and it's March and the year is 2002. Yes, she knows that much, but what the date is and so on, no, she doesn't get that far. And anyway, why should she bother? What does it matter anyway? She thinks no matter what she can still, she, uh, uh, well, she thinks no matter what, she can still be safe and solid in herself, the way she was before he disappeared. And then it comes back to her, how he disappeared that Tuesday in late November in 1979. And all at once she is back in the emptiness, she thinks. And she looks at the hall door, and then it opens, and then she sees herself come in and shut the door behind her. And then she sees herself walk into the room, stop, stand there, look at the window. And then she sees her, herself see him standing in front of the window. And she sees standing there in the room that he is standing and looking out into the darkness with his long black hair and his black sweater, the sweater she knitted, she knit him herself, and that he almost always wears when it's cold. He is standing there, she thinks, and he is almost at one with the darkness outside, she thinks. Yes, he is at he is so at one with the darkness that when she opened the door and looked in, she didn't notice at first that he was standing there, even though she knew without thinking it, without saying it to herself, she knew in a way that he'd been standing there like that, she thinks, and that his black sweater and the darkness outside the window would be almost one. He is the darkness. The darkness is him. But still, that's how it is, she thinks. It's almost as though when she came in and saw him standing there, she saw something unexpected. And that's what's really strange because he stands there like that all the time, there in front of the window. It's just that she usually doesn't see it, she thinks, or that she sees it, but doesn't notice it somehow because it's all that his standing there has become a kind of habit, like most anything else. It has become something that just is around her. But now, this time, when she came into the room, she saw him standing there. She saw his black hair and then the black sweater. And now he just stands there and looks out into the darkness. And why is he doing that, she thinks. Why is he just standing there like that? If there was anything to see out the window, now she could probably understand it, but there isn't anything to see, nothing. Just darkness, this heavy, almost black darkness. And then maybe a car might come by and then the light from the car's headlights might light up a stretch in the road. But then again, not many cars come driving by 
And that's just how she wanted it. She wanted to live somewhere where no one else lived, where she and he, Signe and As Asle, Asle, that's his name, Asle, were as alone as possible, somewhere everyone else had left, somewhere where spring is spring, fall is fall, winter is winter, and where summer is summer. She wanted to live somewhere like that, she thinks. But now, when the only thing to see is darkness, why would he just stand there looking out into the darkness? Why does he do that? Why does he just stand there like that all the time when there's nothing to see, she thinks. And if only it was spring now, she thinks. If only spring would come now with its light, with warmer days, with little flowers in the meadows, with trees putting out buds and leaves. Because this darkness, this endless darkness all the time, she can't stand it, she thinks. And she has to say something to him. Something, she thinks. And then it's as if nothing is what it was, she thinks. She looks around the room. Yes, everything is what it was. Nothing is different. Why does she think that? that something is different, she thinks. Why should anything be different? Why would she think something like that, that anything could really be different, she thinks. Because there is, standing in front of the window, almost impossible to separate from the darkness outside. But what has been wrong with him lately? Has something happened? Has he changed? Why has he gotten so quiet? But yes, quiet, yes. He was always a quiet type, she thinks. Whatever else you can say about him, he's always been quiet. So that's nothing out of the ordinary. After all, it's, it's just how he is. That's just the way he acts. That's just how it is, she thinks. And now if only he could turn around and face her, just say something to her, she thinks, anything. Just say anything, but he keeps standing there as if he never even noticed her come in. So <laughs> uh, you can see, I think, some parallels with minimalism in music with this uh, it's kind of repetition as if nothing is really happening, but things do happen in the novel. And uh, or this novella, because it's only uh, 106 pages long, and so I jump ahead. And what happens is that she or he or the narrator has images of the family and the history in the back. And a little boy, age of seven, with the same name as her disappeared husband, was a great or great or grand uncle uh, back at the turn of the previous century. Uh, to uh, our missing person. So it had the same name, Asla. And so I, I'm going over two thirds through the book and reading another little section here. And uh, I'll try to keep it not too long. And this boy is given a boat and he takes a little model boat. He takes it to the shoreline and follows it and it, it drifts away. It, apparently, and he tries to get it, and one way or the other, he, he, he's drowned. And his mother, Britta, finds him, and his father is named Christopher, and his mother is named Britta. So I'll just read a little of this, give you a taste of it. <clears throat> Again, no quotes, uh, no periods. Well, otherwise, it's good English. Asla is dead, Christopher says. Asla's alive, Britta says. Don't say that, Christopher. Don't say that he's dead, she says. Asla's gone, Christopher says. He's dead, he says. And Christopher starts to walk up the little road. He goes around the corner. He walks across the yard, slowly, step by step. And the fish on the string swing slowly from side to side. And it is as if Christopher will collapse before he takes half a step and turn the earth that he walks on, she thinks. 
and she sees Christopher stop and stand and look down. He stands there with a string with fish on it in one hand and he looks down and she turns around and then she starts to go down the little road and she stops next to Britta and then she lifts her hand and then she lightly smooths down Britta's hair. She strokes and strokes and smooths down her hair and then she hears footsteps and then she sees Christopher coming walking down the little road and the fish on the string are swinging from side to side and Christopher stops too. And then he also smooths down Britta's hair, Britta's the mother. Come inside now, Britta, Christopher says. You can't just stand there, he says. We have to go inside, he says. We have to take Asla inside, he says. And Britta looks up and through her long hair, she looks at Christopher. It's November 17th today, Britta says. November 17th, 1897, Christopher says. November 17th, 1897, Britta says. And Christopher puts his arm around Britta's shoulders and Christopher and Britta and Britta with Asla in her arms slowly walk up the little road. On November 17th, 1897, Asla died, Britta says. And he was born on November 17th. 1890, he got this gift of a boat that uh, on his birthday. That's uh, part of the story there. She says, and Christopher stops and Britta stops, and then they stand there and look down at the brown earth. And then the front door of the old house opens, and an old woman comes out and stops on the front step. And Christopher looks at her. He's gone. Asla's gone, old Alice. Christopher says, don't just stand there like that, old Alice says. The Lord moves in mysterious ways, she says. He is happy, Asla's happy now with God in heaven. So don't be sad, she says. Don't be sad, she says. God is good, he is, she says. And old Alice lifts one hand with a stubby bent finger up to her eye. She rubs along the edge of her eye with the side of her finger. God is good, she says. Alice is the grandmother of, of this boy. So very, very meaningful and, and uh, very powerful in, in its way. Uh, actually much more powerful read aloud than when I read it to myself because, and that's why I think he's become such a well-known playwright having never seen any of his plays. Let me read from the other book. Oh, here I am. The other book is called A Shining, A Shining. And this is an interesting one. I referred to his experience in a near-death uh, experience at the age of seven. They don't mention this at all about this book, but clearly he describes a, a guy himself, the person, drives, uh, he's, he doesn't know where to go, beginning of the book, and he drives and he says, I'm going to make a left turn and then a right turn and then a left turn and a right turn as I see them. And he finds himself on a forest road and he gets stuck and it's winter. And he, he leaves the car for some reason because, and he says, this is stupid, I'm going to get frozen or something. He walks into the forest and he sees a shining and that's the name of the book, A Shining. And then he runs into his parents. So I'm going to read just a little bit about this. And he is in this forest and he says, I see, are you looking for me? And there's no answer. I see them standing there, my mother and father. And they look at me. and They don't answer when I talk to them. And of course, they need to, because in spite of everything, I'm their son. And I say, you need to answer me when I'm talking to you. So answer. Don't just stand there. Answer me. You need to answer me. And I hear that my voice is begging and pleading, almost pitiful. Yes, I'm downright whimpering. You could say maybe exhausted, too, or else it's like it's not my voice. It's like someone else is speaking through me someone I don't know, 
total stranger, actually. My mother says, why are you just standing there? And I don't say it, and, and I don't say anything. And she looks at my father and she says, say something. Why are you just standing there not saying anything? Can't you talk? Have you lost the use of speech? You need to say something. And my mother looks at my father and she says, say something, you too. And my father doesn't say anything. And she says, it's always the same. You never say anything. Not even when your son is standing right in front of you, just a few feet away, do you say something. Can't you say something? You need to say something. You need to say that he has to come with us and then we have to get out of the forest, walk out of the forest together. And my father says, yes. My mother says, you can't just say yes. Uh, incidentally, there are no quotes here. So it's just... And my father says, no. And my mother says, you just say yes or no. And my father says, yes. And then they just stand there. My mother and father, they stand there stiffly. Again, they're standing like that. And I think, I think that I have to go over to them. Doesn't make any sense to stand at a distance like this and just look at each other. But I stay where I am and they stay where they are. And so we just stand like that and look at each other and then look down and look back at each other and look back down. No, it can't go on like this, I think. I'll walk over to them now, I think. But I just... Uh, uh, but I just stay where I am. And I see my mother take my father by the arm and pull a little on his arm. That's what it looks like. But they stay where they're standing. And I stay where I'm standing. And I look up and I see the stars aren't visible anymore. There are clouds covering the stars and everything has gotten much darker. Now the moon is half covered by clouds, I see. And I see clouds moving, covering the whole moon. And then it's totally dark, and I can barely see my mother and father anymore. They've disappeared into the darkness. They're both totally covered in darkness now. And I'm alone in the darkness again, exactly like I was before. I can't see anything. And my parents, they are here just now. I saw them. I did. They were here. But where did they go? Well, obviously, they just disappeared into the darkness. They're not visible now the way nothing is visible when it gets dark enough, black enough. Now the moon is covered by clouds and no one can see anything anymore. I hear my mother calling out, where are you? And I hear my father say, here I am. And my mother says, she knows that. She's holding his arm, she says. She didn't mean him. She meant me, she says. And my father says, yes, of course. I just answered without thinking. And my mother says, yes, same as always, and it's silent, and neither of them say anything. I stand totally silent. I want to be totally silent. I want to listen to the silence, because it's in silence that God can be heard. Someone said that anyway, or something like that. But in any case, I can't hear any voice of God. The only thing I can hear is, yes, nothing. Then I listen to the nothing. I hear if the nothing can be heard, if that's not just a figure of speech, just something people say, I think, yes, I hear, yes, the nothing, not anything, not in any case, the voice of God, whatever that is, but I'll leave that for other people to decide, I think. And obviously, it wasn't my parents I saw just now, that must have been something I just imagined because I'm alone now in the dark forest, alone, all alone, as they say, all alone. Another example, really interesting. It's kind of mesmerizing in a way, uh, even though it doesn't seem to be getting anywhere. Uh, at the end, he sees another person and his parents and his child are barefoot, We're almost done. So I wanted to, um, Go back to the slides, and uh, I just have one more slide because I was very frustrated because I couldn't find any of his plays. And uh, we'll pull this up again. I have my controlling device. 
and uh, we'll go to one slide. And it's a funny, it's, an, it's a trailer for a, a performance of his. Uh, we'll go to the next that works. Oh, that's pretty sound. Can we go to the next slide, maybe? Oh, let's see. Anyway, I found a trailer on YouTube for a performance of his play. Uh, and uh, the slide, the next slide, it's called Someone is Going to Come. And it's, and it's just a trailer, so it has little snippets of the play, but you will recognize the the language. Oh, did I press something wrong? I think I pressed. Just you and I. You and I. You and I. Someone is going to come. As soon as we go in, someone is going to come and knock on the door. Knock and knock on the door. Someone is going to knock on the door. Knock and knock on the door. And not give up. Just knock. Someone is going to come and knock on the door. Someone is going to come. No. Can't you just sit down here on the bench beside me? No one is going to come. She is going to come and I can't bear it. I can't bear that someone is going to come and that she is going to come. Can't you just sit down here? Or maybe there is someone there already. Maybe someone is in the house. No one is going to come. There. Did you hear that? Was it footsteps? It was something. Uh, I think I heard footsteps. Perhaps we can keep each other company. Do you want to? No. I'm not uh, all that bad, let me tell you. You don't see anything? Nothing? No! Okay, well, that, you, you hear the same thing on the play, and I dying to see a play by him. It, if it doesn't, it came to me immediately and to you too, Waiting for Godot by Beckett. And he is sometimes referred to as the 21st century Beckett. And I thought that was an appropriate comparison. I don't remember Waiting for Godot, but I know I enjoyed it completely, even though Godot never came. And so we have interesting parallels there. This is NobelPrize.org at all sorts of information. Some you want, some you may not want, but it's worth exploring for all of our six classes. And um, I wish you well. And next week, we have Ben Smith speaking on uh, the Peace Prize. Uh, and it should be a lot of fun. Thanks for coming. Pretty good time. Yes. Yeah. So, um, any questions? Not that I have answers, but I'm happy to entertain questions. Hi. I don't know if this is working. Okay. Uh, it seems to me it's stream of consciousness. All it is yeah. is stream of consciousness. Yeah. And in the pianist, I could hear a melody. I really could. Uh, and this, it's just whatever comes to their mind, obviously, but right. stream of consciousness, and that's probably why he doesn't use the uh, punctuations. Yeah, why well, have periods? Um, because don't, we don't have periods in our heads. Uh, well, some of them. But um, yeah, it is stream of consciousness, and the repetition, I like to think I don't keep repeating myself in my head, but I probably do. It's, it's, it, 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 but it neurotic. is remarkably addictive. I. In reading these books, reading them aloud is, I think, a lot better than reading them to myself because, because it makes more sense. And uh, so thank you for the opportunity to read them aloud. I don't have that often. I'm just curious about uh, the uh, right, Russian writer Konstantin Palpovsky. Uh, he was one of the people that was ripped off from the Nobel Prize because the Swedish ambassador was summoned by the Soviet government to not give him the prize, but he's considered the Russian Proust. Mm -hmm. 
He wrote a story of a life and remarkable, uh, powerful writing, especially now considering considering the Ukrainian Russian situation. Right. Yeah. Well, as I said, if we didn't get Marcel Proust a prize, why give it to him? No, I'm kidding. I don't I don't know that author, frankly. So I'll he's a fabulous writer. New York Review of Books uh, has done his writing. Right. Yeah, good. Uh, his book. That's, that's really interesting. Yeah, good. The uh, there's a lot of politics in the Nobel Prizes, as you might imagine. Um, <laughs> Some of the winners in Germany during the Hitler regime were banned from uh, accepting their prizes. Other prizes were given to them. And then as the war developed, they hid, hid the medals, pure gold, and it was then dissolved into um, what they call um, aqua, um, John knows, John Axe knows, uh, Aqua Regia, Aqua Regia, which dissolves gold. And it was, they dissolved the gold. And then after the war, the gold was recovered and reminted their prizes uh, because uh, it, it's quite complicated. Yeah. Yeah. Have there been any insights uh, after the documents have been opened up on the decision making uh, after 50 years? Not that I know of, uh, frankly. Uh, all the brag, all those who bragged that they were nominated have died. So it becomes a moot point. Um, they've been, anyway, I don't know that. I bet I could find out. I'll find out. John, thank you for kicking off our spring yeah. semester. Great lesson. Thank you. Yeah, good. Of course, I kicked it off because nobody else wanted the date.